Hi everyone and welcome to Red Ink Mysteries. Today we're going to be discussing the case of Jesse Capen, a 35 year old who went in search of the Dutchman gold mine that allegedly exists in the Superstition mountain range in Arizona, USA. He was so obsessed with this gold mine that he told his mother one day goodbye. He's going on a month trip in search of the mine. He left and never returned. His mother described her son as a gentle giant. He was six foot four, weighed over 200 pounds, and was just the kindest man you would ever, ever meet. So there are aspects of this case that don't set well with me. This case has been discussed extensively in the past, but once again, I see missing 411 criteria in some of the details here. This is my own opinion. If you share my opinion or you have others, please leave comments down below. And with that, let's get started. The Superstition Mountains, located in Tonto National Forest, east of Apache Junction in Arizona, USA, is a strange and deadly place, steeped in ancient legends of strange forces causing dozens of explorers to vanish without a trace. The early inhabitants of the area, including the Salado, Hohokam, and Apache Indians came prior to the Spanish conquistadors. The first Spanish conquistador to arrive was Francisco Vasquez de Coronado, who came north from Mexico in 1540, seeking the legendary Seven Golden Cities of Cibola. When the Spaniards searched the mountains for gold, they began to vanish mysteriously. The bodies that were found were mutilated with their heads cut off. Since the terrified survivors refused to return to the mountain, Coronado named the series of peaks Monte Superstition. The mountain became a legendary spot to all who followed and was regarded by many as an evil place. American trappers and adventurers migrated to the area. Cattlemen and farmers soon followed. Later, the U.S. Cavalry was sent west to establish forts to protect the growing population. Decades later, miners began searching for what was touted as the richest gold mine in the world. This mine was made famous by Jacob Waltz, known as the Dutchman, who took the secret of his mine to the grave in 1891. Treasure hunters continue to scour the mountains, searching for the lost Dutchman mine but now share the region with campers, hikers, backpackers, and horseback riders in what is now the Superstition Wilderness Area. Jesse Capen, 35 years old, became interested sometime in the 1990s with the story of the lost Dutchman gold mine of Jacob Waltz. He bought and read numerous books and maps and searched the internet for information about the lost mine in the rugged Superstition Mountains of Central Arizona. Jesse accumulated over 100 books, maps, and documents concerning the mine. He became especially interested in S.D. Canaster's book, The Sterling Legend, the facts behind the lost Dutchman mine. Jesse believed the book held the key to finding the mine. Canaster's book indicated the mine was located somewhere on the southwestern end of Tortilla Mountain in the Superstition Range. Jesse Capen was employed as a bellhop at the downtown Denver, Colorado Sheridan Hotel and had worked the late shift there at the hotel for over a decade. Jesse lived only a few blocks from the Sheraton and the heart of downtown Denver. Tom Gurley, the manager of the hotel, and co-worker Terry Rays both spoke highly of Jesse Capen and remarked about his keen interest in the lost mine legend. In November of 2009, Jesse had arranged with the hotel to take a month's vacation. Jesse had planned to drive to Arizona and search the superstitions for the lost Dutchman mine. Before he left Denver, Jesse traded his car for a four-wheel drive Jeep. 
Terry Keyes noted Jesse had over the past 10 years made at least two other trips to Arizona to hunt for the mine. Toward the end of November 2009, Jesse loaded his Jeep with supplies and camping equipment and left Denver for the Superstition Mountains. He would stay at a motel in Apache Junction, near the base of the Superstition Mountains. Jesse checked in at the Apache Junction Motel and arranged to stay for a month, the plan being to return to Colorado just before Christmas 2009. Over the next few days, Jesse stocked up on food, water, and emergency supplies, which he stored at his motel room. Jesse planned to go out into the mountains where he would camp for four to five days looking for the mine, then return to his hotel room in Apache Junction for a day or two and resupply before going out again. On December 3rd, 2009, Jesse drove his Jeep out to the Tortilla Ranch trailhead and parked it by the old windmill at the ranch. Jesse carried his supplies and equipment to a campsite he had selected along the trail. His selected campsite was on the southwest end of the Tortilla Mountain, the area in S.D. Canaster's book where she wrote the Lost Dutchman Mine might be located. Jesse set up his camp just a few feet off of the trail in a fairly flat and open area. It is unclear if Jesse even spent a single night at his campsite as there were some severe storms in the area that evening and the next day, and some believe Jesse went back to his Jeep at the trailhead and spent the night of the third in his Jeep. Jesse had set up his tent, but it didn't appear to have been slept in. When the tent was found, it had been flattened by high winds and rain from the storms. Some of Jesse's things were found in the tent, but nothing appeared as if Jesse had spent the night there. Whatever might have happened, Jesse Capen disappeared the night of the 3rd, December 2009, and wasn't seen again for almost three years. When Jesse failed to call his family back in Denver, they became worried and notified authorities in Apache Junction. Jesse's Jeep and camp had already been found, but there were no trace of Jesse anywhere. He had vanished into the mysterious Superstition Mountain wilderness. A search was immediately formed, and about 100 searchers began to comb the terrain around Jesse's campsite. Even though trained search and rescue crews, dogs, and helicopters were called in, no one can find any trace of Jesse. The 3rd and 4th of December 2009 experienced very heavy thunderstorms, with a lot of damaging winds, rain, and lightning. Boot tracks were found that were believed to be Jesse's, but due to the heavy rains, they washed out and were impossible to follow for any distance. For over two years, searchers were out almost every weekend looking for Jesse. Finally, in December 2011, over two years after Jesse disappeared, a hiker was atop Tortilla Mountain at its highest peak where he found a glass jar with a note inside. He found written on the note the words, Colorado, Jesse Capen, 12-4-2009. Jesse Capen had been on top of Tortilla Mountain sometime on the 4th of December 2009, one day after he went into the Superstition Mountains. The search for Jesse was renewed, but still no sign of him could be found. Almost another year went by when one weekend in late November of 2012, a hiker stumbled upon a backpack in the brush laying at the foot of a cliff on the southwest end of Tortilla Mountain. In that backpack was found Jesse Capen's identification, his camera, and some clothing. There was no sign of Jesse, however. A week went by and searchers scoured the entire area around the place where the backpack was found. Finally, someone standing on the spot where the backpack had been found looked up and saw something on a crevice ledge about 35 feet up the cliff face. It appeared to be a boot. Upon investigation, the three-year-old mystery was finally solved. The boot was that of Jesse Capen, and his skeletal remains were found wedged in a small crevice. Jesse had fallen about 150 feet from the cliff above and landed on a small ledge and became entangled in the crevice there. The backpack had fallen all the way to the bottom of the cliff where it had lain hidden in the thick brush. Jesse's body was found less than one third of a mile from his camp and within sight of his camp. Investigators tried to piece together what had happened. It appeared Jesse had hiked to the top of Tortilla Mountain on the 4th of December where he wrote his name on the summit log and placed it in a glass jar. Then seeing his camp from atop Tortilla Mountain, he made a straight line hike toward his camp. 
It must have been late and getting dark, and the storm that evening was brewing at the time Jesse headed for his camp. Okay, so that, what I just read, was some of the details from various news reports relating to the disappearance of Jesse Capen. Now, there are so many assumptions by authorities and the media that I just, I can't, I cannot accept. I mean, their, their assumption is that he finally made it back, but it was dark, it was stormy, he saw his car, got excited, and fell off a cliff. I'm sorry, I just, I just can't. I can't accept that. There's another uh, conspiracy that I want to run by you really quick before we get into some of these details, okay? Um, Jesse was not alone when he rented the room in Apache Junction. Now, I'm reading this from um, a couple of sources that, that I found uh, in relation to the case. Uh, he was not alone when he paid for his breakfast for, the, for two at the Jack in the Box restaurant, and he was not alone on Tortilla Mountain. In his tent were found his hiking boots, yet he was found with his boots on his feet. His wallet was found lying on top of his partially collapsed tent yet he had another wallet on his person. The backpack found away from the body almost proves that someone else threw it there, or it should have been on his own back or in his hands. Inside Jesse's tent was a second sleeping bag, too small for Jesse to have, to have fit in. It is as Jesse was a, fa oh, okay, as Jesse was a fairly large man. Someone knows exactly what happened, but has not come forward with that information. Now, this is someone else's speculation based on the fact that there was a jack-in-the-box charge found that was for two meals, and also someone had reported that he was not alone when he checked into the hotel. So, I could not find any more on this. So this is sort of in the realm of conspiracy theories. One last thing, uh, Capen's mother, pri prior to Jesse being found, said her son was obsessed with the lost Dutchman mine and he had more than 100 books and maps about it. He arrived in Apache, Apache Junction, east of Phoenix, on November 22nd to begin looking for the mine. He was beyond obsessed, she said. Burnett said she fears her son may have been bitten by a rattlesnake or injured in a fall and then attacked by a bear. She described her son as a gentle giant, being six foot four and more than 200 pounds. Now, in relation to missing 411, where thousands of people around the world are missing in national parks, there, if you ever want to look at the criteria yourself, it is so fascinating. These, these missing persons have very specific criteria, some of which are in this case. First of all, being located near large large granite structures. Superstition Mountain is made up of many different rocks, but uh, a lot of granite, a weather event that occurs at the time of separation or of the disappearance. There's usually a lot of times, for some reason inexplicably, articles of clothing or shoes and sp uh, specifically will be uh, removed from the body. The body will be found usually with no official cause of death. I mean, th in other words, they, they there's, there's no official trauma to the body to, to conclusively determine cause of death. They'll usually just say died of natural causes or drowning or, you know, uh, you know uh, dehydration or something like that. And, and, and so many of these are present here. I mean, let's take a look at this. So firstly, at the time Jesse went missing, after he signed the summit log, put it in the jar, this is when thunderstorms, they can confirm that on that on that date, I forget the date, what is it, December 4th or something, uh, during for two, two days, I think, two or three days, uh, major thunderstorms rolled in right then. Much of the Superstition Mountains are comprised of granite. Jesse's shoes and wallet were found separated from his body. And the body, guys, this is the weird, this is one of the two weirdest things. We're saving the, the, the weirdest two for last. His body was found in a tiny crevice, and those uh, uh, searchers that found him said that the crevice was so small they can't believe he managed to end up inside. So their theory was, well, he fe they're saying he fell 150 feet. Guys, have you ever thrown anything off a mountain? Anything. 150 feet onto solid granite? It explodes, okay? His bones were completely intact. There was no sign of trauma to the bones. 
how did he end up in a in a crevice that was barely big enough to hold his remains? What he fell 150 feet and just got wedged in it? Well, without injury, without broken bones? Nah. Now let me let me say this. Some of you are going, Scott. What's your point? My point, by the way, yeah, I'm Scott. <laughs> I don't usually say my name a lot in in these videos. In a lot of these strange disappearances in national national parks, uh, and not just national parks, around the world, uh, go ahead and, and and research this yourself. It's so strange. There was one in Japan I was looking at. Um, uh, these people vanish sometimes, and when they find them, they're wedged in tiny inaccessible and that is the key word inaccessible areas so small that they barely fit there's never any signs of crushed bones or trauma to the bodies they're just there it's almost like they teleported there or what i believe a lot of times and i know some people are going to roll their eyes i believe that this universe is 99 percent bizarro land magic we have no idea what's out there and i think sometimes i don't know maybe there's dimensional overlap or something and these people phase out temporarily phase out to another dimension and back and when they do they're just slightly off course they're not placed back in exactly the same place they're always within a few hundred a few hundred yards or in this case a third of a mile away from where he originally disappeared and they get wedged in these tiny little compartmentalized areas. It's so bizarre. Have a look at the information yourself. Uh, it is so strange. So, because what is the other, exp I mean, I know that's a crazy explanation, but what's the other explanation? If he literally fell to his death, he would be busted up. The bones would be broken. At least one, but they weren't. He just kind of materialized in this little crevice. Okay, and so that's that's bizarre enough for me. But then here we go with the biggest the biggest indicator of a missing 411 uh, case of all. The body was found 2 years later, one third of a mile from Jesse's truck in an area that had been thoroughly searched prior. Guys, one third of a mile is not far at all. Searchers, hundreds of people, helicopters, everything scoured. Definitely scoured that area. And he wasn't there. Two years later, he's there. Not only there, he's wedged in a crevice that he shouldn't have been able to crawl into in the first place. And if he would have fell, and that's how he got wedged into the tiny space, he would have had bro broken bones. You cannot fall 150 feet when you weigh 200 pounds and not break something. No one has mentioned any of this. They mentioned, oh, it's weird that he was in a crevice. I, but you know what? I had to go through about 20 uh, news reports to even find that detail, that the crevice was very small. Because everyone assumes it's this natural thing. He just went hiking, he was exhausted, he finally got back, it was dark, he got excited, he was a little disoriented from being exhausted and he fell to his doom. And I don't believe that at all. I believe that this was a, call it a natural phenomena. To me, it's definitely a missing 411 case. And what is really creepy to me is that I keep looking at some of these old cases. You know, this was from 2009. And where they're just case closed as, you know, cause of death, natural causes, or, or um, you know, accidental death, uh, I look and there are very, very specific missing 411 criteria. And not just one, not just two, usually at least three or more. And that's true in the case of the gentle giant, Jesse Capon. And you know, in going through these cases, like the, the past couple of videos I did were of missing persons who uh, were later found and uh, deceased. And you know, my, I really, I, my heart reaches out to these, to the families, you know, and I'm not going to go too much into this. I don't want to get too emotional, but you know, we enjoy these stories. They're, they, they titillate us and, and they're, they're mysterious and perplexing. 
But oftentimes we don't think about the families who had to endure this. And so, uh, and so I just, maybe I, I ask that we, you know, just maybe remember them. Just, just remember them. And, and in that way, uh, they live on uh, in, a, in, our, in our thoughts. And uh, Jesse Capen seemed like a really good guy. He was really obsessed with that gold mine, as a lot of people are. And uh, I don't know if you guys have done any research on the uh, Lost Dutchman gold mine, but oh, and the Superstition Mountains. Guys, this is a freaky place. It is a Bermuda Triangle of Arizona. Uh, and uh, it, is, it is full of hundreds and hundreds of years of some of the most insane disappearances and murders and missing persons and I mean everything from I mean there is UFO so many UFO sightings out there missing persons bodies found headless you name it it's all in the superstition mountains and it, the superstition mountains aren't even that big I mean it's I, I, I don't know exactly how how expansive it is but compared to a lot of uh, mountain ranges that span a thousand miles or something uh, they're, they're very small it's very small by comparison and uh it's just it's just so bizarre such a bizarre story and such a bizarre place i thank you so much for stopping by i hope you enjoyed the video and we will see you next time